Our next speaker is Monty Simus, uh, an expert on water, energy, and food systems. He's also founder of Water Politics and returning back to campus as an impact leader in residence at the Advanced Leadership Initiative. Thank you very much, Renata. Well, first off, I should thank Renata. Well, to express my appreciation for you, two things. First, Renata didn't mention that this is my fourth time back at Harvard, which usually gives rise to, as my 18-year-old son says, like, when am I actually going to finish learning or get to the point of concluding? But, uh, and the second thing I'd like to appreciate or express appreciation for is just the folks that put on this event. I looked at the brochure as I was sitting here in the, uh, in, 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 during the break, and there's 13 different parts of Harvard that give students an opportunity to sort of engage with the public sector, civic sector, and I think that's super important. I, you know, Connor was spot on. I was at Y2Y this morning. It's a really an incredible organization, an incredible shelter, so there's just a really large breadth of opportunities for students and others in the community to engage, so thank you. Um, today, actually, I'm probably going to be the only person that's not talking about a, an organization, per se. Um, and it's because I primarily want to talk to you about an issue. Um, I normally start my discussion related to water with the sort of famous quote, right, that uh, uh, whiskey's for drinking and water's worth fighting over. But I thought the population is going to be students. So, <laughs> so I didn't want to get in any trouble. So. I then come up with this one, which is Deadpool, because I know most young people uh, immediately get to uh, Deadpool. But um, the piece of Deadpool that I want to talk about is not the famous Marvel character, of course, but it's this hydrological issue that's arising these days in our thirsty world, our growing uh, world in which we have uh, more and more water scarcity. And that's, the, that's the, the time when water level gets so low behind a dam that there's no uh, ability to uh, have water released downstream. Um, this is. Uh, a quick image of, uh, of Glen Canyon Dam, um, Lake Powell. You know, it's probably going to arrive at the situation before we see it at Hoover Dam and Lake Mead, but it's coming. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about water from a broad perspective. Um, you know, water is something which we all interact with on a daily basis, whether it's with uh, a bottle, whether it's uh, you know, shower, bath, whether we're recreational users of it, and. Uh, and, and I'm here to sort of try to motivate you folks to think of water in a slightly broader perspective. So first off, um, why are we even sort of concerned or interested in water? Um, well, we live in a world today where, uh, as I said, I call it a thirsty world or a, a world in which uh, we're, we're all going to be arriving at more and more scarcity. And in this image, the red band that you see in sort of the logically uh, uh, places that you logically conclude is where uh, a lot of people are sort of feeling it firsthand day to day. So North Africa, uh, Middle East, Northern China, um, and a little bit even in North and South America. But if you fast forward just a few years, um, you see the red band starts to get really large, right? So now all of a sudden we're spanning, you know, the five, five of the world's largest countries. So you have all of China on this map in red, you have all of India on this map in red, you have Pakistan, you have Indonesia, and you have the United States. So I didn't do all the tallies, but uh, I mean, those are uh, the, the vast lion's share of the world's population today. So we have a situation which is uh, <clears throat> difficult. Um, it's growing in, uh, in impact. And it's not just a question, or it's not just an issue of availability uh, or accessibility. It's all about equity. Because if you look at the places which are starting to rise and feel more and more stress, these are some of the youngest countries in the world, some of the most, or uh, some of the least economically strong countries in the world. And um, you know, in North America, we may be able to uh, engineer our way out of it. Um, but you know, if you're a young country with a lot, not a lot of resources, it's going to be really difficult. So the world as its whole, as a whole, has to decide. You know, do we want to solve our problem? Do we want to solve the world's problem? And I'm hopefully here to encourage you folks to sort of think about this problem as one that you might want to tackle on any, any jurisdiction level as you go forward in your careers. 
Um, and this is my last sort of slide about sort of the problem at hand here. Um, as countries develop, of course, they use more and more water. So you know, scarce today, getting more scarce in the future, more and more countries developing, needing more water, and you have on top of this layered on urbanization, water needs to be moved in a very different fashion. So if that wasn't bad enough, uh, water is really uh, interesting because it's inextricably linked with two other resources. So the water energy food nexus is one in which you can't impact one of the three uh, key resources without moving the other two. So if you just think through this, it took me a little while. <clears throat> At the end, I'll share a little bit about my journey through this subject. But, um, you know, most people start with water or start with one of them. But, uh, you know, if you want to increase uh, energy, um, you know, usually, uh, until we get more and more solar deployed, I mean, water's involved in the process, whether it's a thermal plant and you're, you know, you're creating steam from pools of water, or maybe you're running water across the hydro dams we saw earlier in the presentation. Um, so you have a link between water and energy. Um, if you want to grow more food, you're usually going to have to move water from some area to where the food or where the uh, agricultural area is. So you're either lifting it out of the ground, pumping it out of the ground, or you're moving across ground canals. And uh, you know, so, so really, you know, water can't be sort of a siloed problem. It is a problem that now impacts not only greater pieces of our world's population, but uh, many other resources as well. Um, you know, and it's not just an issue, again, of scarcity. And so here's an example of the water energy nexus. Uh, I think there's 16 dams on this chart on the Mekong River, but there's more coming. But really what you have, and I'll pop up here, this is a look here at Ethiopia. You, you have issues related to the politics of water. So here in Africa, you have <coughs> shared watershed, the Nile. Um, you have the two largest or the two most militarized African countries, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt, and they're arguing with one another about use of the Nile water. And of course, people will have to move if they can't find water where they're gonna live. So <coughs> let me quickly uh, uh, move ahead, because the issue I'm trying to sort of uh, share with you is that water is not a siloed issue. So however you want to think about water, whether it's from a hydrological perspective, a historical perspective, a health perspective, an equity perspective, a legal perspective, a policy perspective, just take all these different considerations in mind. And this is what I think is sort of the beautiful part about water and water-related issues, is that you can tackle it from many, many different angles. Historically, however, we haven't done this. It's always been sort of a siloed approach, right? When I first came to Harvard, um, I, you know, I was here before some of you had actually been born yet, but like it was a very siloed issue. Like I had to go to the School of Engineering, right? And that it's gonna be an engineering-led solution. And I was at the Kennedy School, it's gonna be a policy-led uh, approach. Now that I'm back this year, um, I'm really pleased to find that sort of there's these really what I'll call pools, pools of interested uh, scholarship related to water. And, you find them in the School of Design, you find them in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, you sometimes even find them in the Divinity School. So <clears throat> just keep an eye for different uh, perspectives. And uh, as I said, my, my, my mission here, or my motive is just to encourage you all to think of this problem in a much more sort of creative fashion. Um, here's my journey. As I said, don't follow this because I fell into the, holy, the totally siloed approach. Um, so I studied environmental history, not here at this institution. Um, I then uh, started writing about the politics of water because that was my siloed interest. I was gonna be geopolitics of shared watersheds. Um, took me a few years and then I started uh, understanding the relationship between water and energy. So this is where you see sort of water G nexus pop up. Um, I then came back. So finally 2015, I was here with the Advanced Leadership Initiative to look at sort of the water energy food Nexus, but I adopted a very siloed solution to that. I looked very much at uh, indoor or vertical farming. Um, I then went out and worked in the industry. I then realized that that probably wasn't the most, uh, 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 there were other ways to <coughs> achieve a, a bigger, broader solution. I went to work for a nonprofit that looked at aquatic food systems. So this is just, a, a, again, another lens on sort of the water relationship to food and to agriculture. And finally, now I've returned to Harvard uh, this year to set up, um, well, to do some work around what I call the uh, Global Water uh, uh, Politics and Justice Initiative. So this is my effort to actually develop some thinking, develop a curriculum, 
and developed some, uh, some, some papers and some research around these intersection of these three issues. So um, with that, I will uh, uh, again express my appreciation for the chance to speak with you folks and uh, happy to catch up afterwards, but I'll turn it back over to Renata and uh, some of my esteemed colleagues on the panel.